morning. Testing. 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 Better. Hello? Okay. All right. Good morning, YouTube world. Melissa says I take my CNA City team on August 4th, and I pass. Thank you so much for your ebook and your video. Oh, congratulations, Melissa. Great job. Uh, good morning, Carrie. Good morning. Good morning, and good morning, Carla. All right. So, okay. Get to the right one. There we go. All right. So let me go. So many buttons to press. All right. Is everybody getting my emails? Is everybody getting my after class email wrap up emails? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you didn't get anything after class on, on Wednesday? Nobody got anything after class on Wednesday? Okay. Yeah, after class. No. Okay. Yeah. All right. I will resend Wednesdays. Um, for some reason, my automatic thing didn't work. Um, and I will make sure I send today's too. But you're definitely want, going to want to keep up with that and you're getting them. So I sent it out today for class. If you're not, if you don't get it, let me know on Wednesday. Um, so I can check your email and make sure that everything is good because you'll need uh, those resources moving forward. All right. So over the weekend, I really wish this thing would Hi. Hi. Testing. Yeah, it does seem to work. All right. So over the weekend, you had two chapters to do. Chapters two and three, they were a little bit longer. Um, not quite as exciting. <laughs> I know, there is a lot to get through. I, I understand. Um, does anybody have any questions on chapters two or three? Anything you want me to explain to you? Good morning. Any questions on chapters two or three? Anything that you missed? You don't know why you missed it? No? All right. Chapter, um, I think it's chapter two, talks about Maslow's hierarchy. You know, that little pyramid-looking triangle thing. And a lot of you guys probably read over it and then just kind of moved on with your life because what does this matter? But it really does matter. For those of you who are going under to nursing, you're going to spend a lot of time on Maslow's hierarchy. And the reason is that we have to understand where our patient is in their journey in order for us to be able to communicate with them well. Does that make sense? Right? So, like, um, I am at a completely different place in my life than somebody who just was diagnosed with terminal cancer and is undergoing chemo and radiation and has to figure out how to get to those appointments and how to maintain their household, and how to pay for all this, right? They got a lot of stressors in their life. And Maslow's hierarchy is a way for us to be able to kind of recognize those stressors and kind of categorize them. So the way to think about this is there's five levels here. And the very first one is literally survival. Now, a lot of you guys think that you can't survive without your cell phone, but I 
assure you, you actually can, right? So people, you know, um, define survival in a little bit different way. But survival is through survival. Oxygen, food, water, right? That's survival. Um, and those are what we call basic needs. Um, safety and security is actually the next step. So once we have um, oxygen, food, and water, then we can start looking at ways of making ourselves safe, you know, like shelter, right? For most of us at the home. Um, uh, keeping your, your own person safe, you know, safety and security. Um, and then you have other levels, right? But we have to understand that nobody's going to reach any other level if they're still working on survival. So if you're telling people, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine, everything's good, they can't hear that. They can't process that because you're talking from a different level than where they actually are. Does that make sense? That's why Maslow's is super important if you're gonna work in healthcare. Because we need to understand that just by being upright and active and working, we're automatically at a different level. So we have to kind of take some time to understand where our patients are in their journey. So our communication can be adjusted to their needs. Good. So those of you who go on for nursing are going to learn a lot about Maslow, more than you ever wanted to know. Um, but it is good to have a general understanding. You will probably have one question on Maslow on the state exam. Okay. All right. So you took you read chapters two and three, you took the test. Did you grade them? All right, let me go ahead and get your scores. Mariah, for both? Great job. Karina, thank you. Karina, do you have one for me, chapter one? Thank you. Zion, thank you. Janice, Jennifer, thank you. Rylan, that's fine. Jashanti? Alana, thank you. Desiree, thank you. Allison, okay, that's 90 on both. Okay, very good, very good. Kristen, Thank you. Keely. Thank you, Delilah. Rebecca. Okay. So any other questions? Chapter four that you have tonight is going to focus on body systems. It seems complex. Understand, guys, that this is a seriously watered down version of body systems. This is basically a fifth grade review. Um, it, those of you who go for nursing, you're going to have two entire semesters of nothing but anatomy and physiology. So that's an entire year. So you have one chapter in this book. And it's really very, very basic, but the way that it's worded gets students very, very confused. Um, it seems like it's more complex than it actually is. You don't need to know at the CNA level, you don't need to know that a stroke is a disorder of the circulatory system. There's no test question that's going to ask what condition is this disease or what a body system is this disease affecting? They don't ask that. They, that's not your role. But you do need to know normal signs of aging. And that's what chapter four is going to go over all of the different body systems and the normal signs of aging for each, but it's not presented that cut and dry. That's what I need you to get out of it. 
So when you're reading it and you're going, ah, remember to drill down to what is a normal sign of aging. Now, why would we need to know what a normal sign of aging is? What's half of our job? Observe and report, right? If we don't know that something is normal, we won't know what to report. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what I really want you to focus on for chapter four is normal signs of aging for each body system. You also need to understand that all the body systems tend to work together. So if we have a problem in one, chances are another one or two or 10 are going to be affected. Okay, so let's see if we remember everything that we learned last week, because that was a long time ago. I don't know about you, but I've lived a lifetime in the last four days. <laughs> so we perform skills as directed on the, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, so that means we can't, yeah, we can add to it, we can't take anything away, we can't modify it. So I know that we're just kind of going through the, the, the words here, right, because I've trained you to repeat after me, <laughs> but it really actually means that we can't add to it. Now, that's important when you go to take the written test, because some of you are going to read a question and you're going to go, well... If this, that doesn't exist in the written question. If your brain tries to add something in or take something away or change the question in some way, you've changed the question and your answer is not going to be right. Does that make sense? So this, follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan, that goes for written test questions too. Okay? Okay answer the question, the whole question, and nothing but the question. Because that's what gets people messed up on the written exam. They add something in. Does that make sense? Okay. We want, while we're following that care plan, what are we going to look for? Any changes. Changes. Yeah, changes, abnormalities, problems, anything that doesn't look, smell, or feel quite right. We need to report it. Who are we going to report it to, though? The nurse. the nurse. Okay. So every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with a knock. knock. What do we need to do? Uh, okay, we got to introduce ourselves. What are we also going to do? Okay, so we're going to address the patient by name, right? Identify our patient by name. In a clinical setting, this doesn't apply to the test, but in a clinical setting, what would we do or what would we, how would we know how to identify somebody that could not identify themselves? Okay, bracelet. What's that? The care plan. Care plan is going to tell us what, how to accommodate this rule for that patient. So these are rules. They can't be violated, right? These are actual rules. So the care plan is going to tell you how to follow this rule on this patient. You guys see how those go together? So these are rules. Can't break the rules. But the rules don't apply to everybody. We have to make sure that we understand how to accommodate these rules to our patients. And that's what the care plan is all about. So I was on Facebook this morning, and this cracked me up. I'm in a lot of groups on Facebook, but I actually got an ad. And the ad was for automated care plan programs. So basically, you put in your patient's conditions, it prints out a care plan for you. Sounds good, doesn't it? What do we know about care plans? It's specific to a patient. Okay, so they're specific to a patient, and they tell us what to do, right? We have to follow that care plan. Not just us, but everybody on the team, dietary, physical therapy, nursing, everybody follows the care plan. 
So do you really think that computer, now I understand we're in the age of AI, I get it, right? AI can do a lot of things, but do you really think that that computer is going to know every single aspect of that patient? So do you think that automated care plans are really gonna tell the whole story? So when you're out there working, understand that automated care plans are being used. They're not gonna tell you the whole story. So when you get a care plan and it doesn't give you the information you need, who do you go to? The nurse. The nurse. If we do that enough, the nurses will stop using those automated care plans and actually write care plans that work. Okay, good. All right, so we're gonna address our patient by name and we're gonna introduce ourselves how. What do they need to know about us? Your name and your position. Okay, name and title, name and position, sure. So, hey, I'm Patty. So. <laughs> Nobody cares. Hey, I'm Patty, your CNA. Oh, okay, now I know why you're here. Does that make sense? Don't forget that. Um, you guys start practicing. So the last class that graduated before you guys started, they come in every, there's a couple of them that come in every single Monday and Wednesday afternoon and practice. And they've been practicing and they're getting ready to test. So they're like stressed, understandably. Well, I was sitting in here on Wednesday and there were two of them in here practicing. And they just walked in and said, hi, I'm here to do range of motion. Is that okay? And I said, okay, let's stop for a second. And I'm not normally in here for practice. So it just happened to be that I heard this. And I said, let's look at that green um, banner on the wall. What two steps did you just forget? She says, I did that. And I said, you did not identify the patient by name and you did not introduce yourself by name and title. I didn't. She didn't even, wasn't even aware of it. So guys, the way that you practice is the way you will perform. If you're used to cutting corners and um, just saying, hi, I'm here to whatever, and you don't do the full opening, when you get to the test, you won't do the full opening and you won't even realize you didn't do it. Because the way you practice is the way you will perform. Don't cut corners on practice, okay? Um, once we've introduced ourselves by name and title, what do we need to get from the patient? Permission. Permission, yeah, is that okay? Then what are we gonna close? The curtain. Why do we have to wait until this point to close the curtain? Right, right. So we don't remove their ability to refuse. Yeah. So we really want to wait until we get that permission before we close the curtain. Then we're going to close the curtain. What's our very next action after we close that curtain? Wash your hands and then gather your Okay. So washing. Why do we have to wash our hands first? Because there's a lot of stuff on that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So don't forget washing your hands and then go get your supplies. Very good. Very good. All right. So sometimes we're going to have to use gloves. Sometimes we won't. How do we know when we need gloves and when we don't? Okay, so if they have non-intact skin, we're going to wear gloves. Personal skin, yep, we need to wear gloves and yeah, ooey gooey, yeah, if we're leaking anything, they sprung a leak somewhere, we need some gloves. Now, if they're not leaking anything and you're not touching personal skin and there's no non-intact skin that's going to be near, do you need gloves? What do you have to do before the skill? What do you have to do after the skill? Yeah, so you're not really worried about patient duties because you're not getting into it and you've washed your hands before and after. But if you wear gloves, don't forget to wash your hands after because remember, those gloves are not a magic suit of armor. Things will get through, so we need to make sure we wash them off. All right. So the first thing your gloves should touch is the patient. That keeps your gloves clean for that patient. You would not want somebody in there brushing your teeth with gloves that have touched everything in the environment. They're not clean, just like the sandwich person. 
right? Um, once we touch the patient, though, our gloves are considered contaminated, so we want to pay really close attention to what we touch in the environment so we're not grossly cross-contaminated. And then we have to remember oil gloves completely or uh, correct. How do we do that? How do we remove gloves? Pinch up. Okay. So pinch up first, under second. Right? Make sure those gloves don't slap around anywhere. Good job. All right. So we're going to use a barrier anytime we use the size, right? And that barrier is going to provide what kind of an area for us? Clean. Yeah, this table is not. So we need a clean area for our clean supplies. And we can only touch supplies with what kind of hands? Clean hands. That means we have to wash our hands before we get our supplies. So this is all a no-brainer for you guys because I've taught this from day one. This is nothing new. You guys are like rolling your eyes. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. But I'm going to tell you that about half of the people that go into tests grab their supplies before they ever address the patient. This is a specific checkpoint. A specific checkpoint. Refrain from touching patient or supplies until hands are clean. So don't get into that trap, okay? Everything I tell you is for a reason. So I'm going to pass this out. This is something I made yesterday. This is actually going in the new book. It is a list of supplies. This is something that most students have trouble with trying to remember what supplies go with what skill. And this is why a lot of people testing go right to the supply shelf and get their supplies first because they're afraid that they're going to forget something. Right? It's totally out of order. It violates every infection control profit, you know, process that we have. So don't do that. You're better off learning the supplies. Does that make sense? So I printed this off for you. Um, you can make copies of this, that's fine. But as we go through the skills and as you're thinking about the skills and as you're getting ready to practice the skills, um, you should look at this and be able to tell me which supplies off of the supply sheet you need for that skill. So if you want to, you can make copies of this, I'll just write at the top, bed pan, and then circle the things that you need. Okay, or mouth care and circle the things that you need. So it's a great way for you to um, practice the supplies you need in kind of a workbook format, okay? So let me just take one and pass, pass them under there. Let me just take one and pass it around. Now, your book does have this, the supply list, but what's different between this one and the one that's actually in your book, I think it's on page 37, I think, or no, not 37, hold on, I'll tell you. Twenty-five. So, twenty-five is a much more simple version of what I just gave you, and um the reason what I just gave you is better is because it has one washcloth, two washcloths, four washcloths, one towel, two towels, one chuck, two chucks. So it doesn't just have you pick the supplies, it has, has you pick the right number of supplies. And that's why this is going to be a, a better study aid for you when you're uh, practicing for the test. Okay. Good. Can you see how that might help? Okay. So our barrier provides a clean area for our clean supplies. We're only going to touch our supplies with clean hands. What can your supplies not touch? Why? Because it's covered in nasty stuff. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And when do we get our barrier? Okay. Should you get your barrier at the same time that you get all of your supplies? No. Why? Because you don't have enough hands. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be all right if you were an octopus. But until we can figure out how to grow a couple extra arms, we have to work with what we have. So we're going to go get the barrier first before we get our supplies. And then go get our supplies and put them on the barrier. Good job. You guys realize how much we learned last week? That's why I like this review. It shows you just how far you've come in one week. Two classes. And I got a long way to go with you. Imagine what you're going to be like at the end of it, right? So we use privacy blankets for two reasons. What are the two reasons? We want to keep the patient okay. warm. So privacy and, and comfort really are the two, uh, two main things here. Remember that privacy is addressed through the privacy curtain, but that really blocks out people on the, the right. It doesn't do anything to protect them from you. And you are a stranger, stranger danger. Absolutely. So we have to use that privacy blanket to make sure our patients feel safe from us. We're going to use a privacy blanket anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed. So if you think to yourself, do I need a privacy blanket for this? Just think, during this skill, is my patient going to be uncovered at any time? If the answer is yes, you need a privacy blanket. Think to yourself, is my patient going to be undressed at any time during the skill? If the answer is yes, you need a privacy blanket. Now, I am going to tell you that there is two exceptions to this rule, privacy blanket, that are okay on the test. I want you to follow this regardless, forever. But for the test, they give you two exceptions for this. One of those, and we're going to get to that when we get to these two skills, but I want to go over this just briefly, get it in your mind. One of those is bedpan. You are not technically required to use a privacy blanket with bedpan because you can use the sheet. The problem is that chances are with bedpan, you're going to get some splashing. So if the sheet gets soiled, what do you think you need to do? Change it. And that's a whole lot more work. If we use a privacy blanket, it keeps the sheet clean, and then we don't have to worry about checking it or changing it after. So the test does allow you to just use the sheet for privacy on bedpan, but it's not best practice. They'll allow it, but it's not best. Make sense? The other skill is supported sideline position. So we're going to flip somebody on their side and use some pillows to keep them there. And you can do that, keeping the patient covered with the sheet. Perfectly okay. So our rule is still applied, right? They're still covered with the sheet. The problem is that after you turn them, you got to get a pillow between their legs. And with a sheet tucked into the bottom of the bed, that's going to be really hard to do. So it's easier to do that still with a privacy blanket, get that sheet out of the way. You're going to have access to all of the patient. But for the test, you may see your partner doing that skill without using a privacy blanket. As long as patients have a little sheet, it's okay. It just makes it harder on them. I'm all about easy. I like easy. So um, those are the two exceptions to privacy blanket. So when we put a privacy blanket on, what do we have to be careful not to do? Shake it or snap it. Why? Yeah, we're bringing all of those pathogens right up where we can breathe them in, and that's no fun for anybody. Once we get that blanket put on over our sheet, we're going to pull the sheet down underneath. That keeps the patient covered at all times, either with the sheet or the blanket, right? We don't take the sheet away and then cover them. Good? Make sense? When we use the privacy blanket, we always remove it at the end of the skill after we've removed our gloves because we don't want to touch that sheet. If we're wearing gloves, we know we were into ooey-gooey. We don't want to touch that sheet. It's going to go right up next to her face with 
those soil gloves. Okay. We also learned briefly about grease and cleaning. And remember for the test, we're simply gonna rinse it, dry it, and store it. But this, the process allows for disinfection if we need to. The big thing I want you to remember about basin cleaning is once you've rinsed the basin and set it down, you cannot pick it up with your hands or your gloves. What do you need? A towel. Paper towel, that's right, that's right. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if we just rinsed it. I get it, but remember that that process is there for disinfection as well. Once it's been disinfected, you can't touch it with your dirty hands. Okay, good. And then finally, we have the closing. Now, there's a lot of steps to the closing. I get it. Like half of your checklist for every skill is the opening and closing. That makes up half of what we do. That's a lot of steps, guys. Can anyone give me at least one of the closing steps? Clean environment. Call light. Comfort. Curtain. Very good. So we want to make sure all of those things are done, right? We've opened the curtain, given them their call light. And by the way, the call light needs to be in their hand. Or at least beside their hand, right? <laughs> um, you want to ask about comfort. They need to hear that word. Are you comfortable? And we want to address emotional comfort too, so offer a magazine, okay? Um, and you want to make sure they're in a clean environment. Those are all correct. When you get all of those things done, they're all done, then Wash your hands. clean your hands. That's right, because of cooties. Yeah, we don't want to take those patients' cooties out of the, the area with us. But what if we forgot to do something and we realize it when we're washing our hands? So we can make a correction, sure. What if we come over and hand them their call lights? Why? Because you touched the cooties. Yeah, cooties. Absolutely cooties. I want you to look over here and see nothing but cooties. Okay. All right. So here's a million dollar idea for anybody that wants to invent something for training programs. Sheets that look just like this, white, but over time. Um, or with light exposure, they, they have like little cartoon cooties on them, right? So you'd be able to kind of see that. So there's a million dollar idea for my inventors. All right. Um, so once we've done all that and we cleaned our hands, if we need to document, we would do so at that time. Remember, documentation is always last after hand washing. But if we document, what do we need to do one more time? Wash our hands again. Good. Questions? Invest in good soap. You're going to need it. A lot of hand washing. All right. So we're going to move on to today's subject. We have a new comment from Andrea. Good morning, Miss Patty. I took my exam on July 19th, passed the written. Then I went back on the 5th of August and passed the skills. Thanks for your videos. Congratulations, Andrea. We're so proud of you. Hello, Terika. Hello, Nahomi, and hello, Campus. Hold on. I hit the wrong button, guys. Hold on a minute. All right. So you guys that are playing along at home, you can turn to page 82 in your skills book. All right. So how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. So the care plan at the top of this page, way up here, tells us to provide hand and nail care to one hand. So how many hands are we doing? What if they have two? Yeah, we don't care. Just do one. You get to pick the one, whichever one you want. 
The patient is sitting in a chair at the bedside and can move as correct. This is pretty easy. This is, guys, a mini mani. That's all we're doing. We're soaking the hand in water, taking it out and washing it. Putting it back in water to rinse it, take it out to dry it. We're going to file the rough edges, clean under the nails with an orange stick, and apply some lotion. That's the whole skill. So you may ask, well, why are we doing this? I mean, why, why, do, why do we need to do this? <laughs> well, there's a couple of reasons. And the main one is that when a patient is in a long-term care facility, you're not going to do this in the hospitals. We don't do it in a nail care in the hospitals. This is for long-term care. So when you are working in long-term care, where a patient lives, um, wherever you live, right, in your home, you probably take care of your own nails. You probably clip them every once in a while, file them, you know. You may go to a nail salon to have them done. That's a possibility. But um, they're getting taken care of. In a long-term care center, however, you may not have the ability to take care of your own nails. And you don't have the ability to go out and have them done. So if you're not doing it and you're not going somewhere to do it, somebody's got to take care of those nails. Now, as CNAs, we cannot use nail clippers. Those are advanced pieces of medical machinery we're not allowed to touch. I know. You're looking at me like I'm nuts. I get it. But the thing is that nail clippers, it's really easy to clip the skin along with the nail. And especially, yeah, especially on somebody else. Now, you're less likely to do this on yourself. But if you're trying to clip somebody else's nails, it's really easy to get that, that skin that's right there in the corner. Have you ever trimmed a baby's nails? Yeah. Yeah, and you probably at least once, whether you admit it or not, <laughs> you probably clip their, their skin just a little bit, and you probably feel horrible over it. Well, the problem is that as we age, we end up with a lot of problems that come along with... Um, injuries. So we have decreased circulation. So that means good blood isn't going to be able to get to the area very well to heal it. We have increased risk of infection because we're not getting up and going to the sink and washing our hands ourselves multiple times a day. We may be on medications like blood thinners that make bleeding hard to control. So there's a lot of problems with accidentally injuring our patients. So we don't use nail clippers, does that make sense? But the thing is, you don't have to use nail clippers, ever, if we do a little preventative maintenance. If you're filing a patient's nails every week, they'll never get long enough to need to be trimmed, right? So we've reduced our risk and we've made sure the patient remains uh, safe. Right? Their nails are at a safe length. So that's what this really is all about. Because they're not getting to the sink and physically washing their hands often, they're going to have a buildup of gunk. We need to get rid of that. And because they're not having their nails taken care of, we want to make sure that we're filing them on a regular basis. That's all this skill is about. Now, the test figures, if we watch you soak one hand, wash one hand, rinse one hand, dry one hand, clean under the nails with one hand, File the rough edges on one hand and lotion one hand. We don't need to see you do the other one. We know you've got it. So that shortens this skill considerably for the test. But in a clinical setting, there's very, very, very few times that it'll ever tell you to do one hand. Most of the time it's two. And you can do them just like they do at the nail salon. One hand at a time or both hands together. Doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Depends on what size basin you're using, right? Good? Make sense? Okay, something else I want to point out since we're on supplies. And um, remember, I've been working on the, the book, right? The new edit of the book. So this has come up in a lot of my classes. And I want to make sure I address this. Do you see how we have the supplies right below the care plan? That might make you think that during the test, they're going to tell you your supplies. They're not. So actually, now that I'm redoing this book, 
the supplies are not going to be on this page. They're going to be on the page before it. Okay. So I'm taking the supplies completely away from the care plan. So remember for the test, this is all you're going to get. What's right there. So we need to learn these supplies before we go take the test, okay? Lots of steps here. 23. Good question. Sure. Provide hand and nail care to one hand. Oh, okay, forget it, that's a good question. I was gonna say, do we do the feet too, but the hand. Yep, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan in. The care plan. Our care plan doesn't say foot. Not a problem. We do have another, if you just turn the page, you'll see foot care. Okay. That's a whole nother skill we're going to learn. So you can just, oh, is this like the new copy? Of like no, no, this is, this is the one you have. We don't have 23. We don't have 23 steps. We have 22. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Let me see your book real quick. Okay. It ends this Okay. I don't know why. I probably took a picture when I was working on the book. I probably did. So, okay, 22 steps. Sorry. Um, I probably split one of these. So, 22 steps. It's a lot of steps. A lot to remember. But there's an easier way to look at this instead of looking at all of those steps that need to be done. Um, if we, oh, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on. Uh, hold on. We're coming back to it. There we go. I need to move this to the front. Okay. So instead of learning 22 steps, we want to look at the principles involved. Now, there's a lot of principles here. I get it, right? It's not much better than 22 steps. But we know to follow the, where the opening is always the same. Every opening starts with a, we know to evaluate whether we need gloves. Now, gloves might be required for this if our patient has an open area. But if the patient doesn't have any open skin, we're not touching anything illegally. We're not touching non-intact skin, and we're not touching personal skin. So as long as there's no um, open areas, you don't need gloves. Now, I will give you a caveat to that. If you have a dementia patient that has lots of gunk under their nails, because they've been digging, then you might want to put some gloves on because that kind of falls under the whole ooey gooey, right? But if this is just on somebody that um, is wheelchair bound and can't get to the sink, but you know their, their hands are not in bad shape, then we don't need gloves. Remember that gloves are always based on the patient, not the skill, okay? So we're gonna use the barrier. Anytime we use supplies. So we already know the first four. Nothing new there. <coughs> These are recycled. We're going to talk about linen rules a little bit later. But the big one here is to remember not to put anything up next to your uniform, which you already know. Washing rules we're going to learn in just a minute. We already know based on cleaning, rinse, dry, store. We're going to learn hand care specifics, and we know the closing. So out of all of this, all 22 steps, you only need to learn linen rules and washing rules. And then we're going to go over steps specific to this skill. So we went from learning 22 down to learning three. Not so bad, right? Not so bad. Okay. So let me go back up here. Okay, so go to page 80 in your book, and we're going to talk about washing bases. We've got washing rules that we're going to learn, just like any other principle. And the first thing that I need you to understand about basins of water is that we don't add soap to basins. And the reason is we have a rule that says whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we 
completely dry. So if we add soap to the base of the water, we have no way of rinsing. Does that make sense? So we don't add soap to the basin. You don't need to add soap to the basin. Now, some of you are going to say, yeah, but Miss Cuddy, you can just go get a second basin for rinse water. And yeah, you can. Sure. But that's twice as much to clean, twice as much to store. And remember last week, so we talked about um, the cost of medicine. You guys remember that? Those basins are expensive. And if you're getting a second basin just to hold clean water for rinsing, that isn't necessary, which means it's an unnecessary cost for your patient. And it's one that can be easily disputed during a bill review. It's one of the things they look for, unnecessary supplies. Make sense? So a better way to do this is not adding soap to your basin. So our rule is basins are no soap zones. Okay? Basins are no soap zones. And all of this is on um, page 80 and 81. So one of the, uh, the ways that I like to explain medical billing is this. You guys heard of like really high end steak places, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a place you go when you know you're going to drop a couple hundred bucks, right? Nothing there is cheap, right? But they are nice enough, even though you know you're going to be spending some money, they are nice enough to put, you know, the totals on the, the menu. They actually tell you what stuff is going to cost, right? Just like or any other restaurant, they actually tell you what you're going to be paying. And you can make decisions based on, you know, well, I can't really afford the porterhouse this trip, so maybe I'll go with uh, sirloin instead, right? You can make decisions based on your budget. But imagine for a second if they did, if you just went in to this high-end steakhouse and you ordered steak and baked potato and um, green beans or, you know, whatever sides you wanted. And um, they said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not going to work like that. We're going to bring you what we think you want, what we think you need. You have no say in it. You're like, uh, okay. So they bring out what they think you should have. Now, along the way, you may ask them, um, how much is this going to cost? Because you've got this whole table of food in front of you. And you've only got a couple hundred dollars to spend here. So you're starting to get a little bit nervous to ask how much is this going to cost. And they go, oh, don't worry about it. We'll give you a bill at the end. How much would you be able to enjoy that? Yeah, because you're thinking, I'm going to have to be doing some dishes at the end of this, or they're taking me out in handcuffs, I'm not sure which, because I may not be able to afford all this. Guys, that is fair. When you go in, you know it's going to be expensive, but you don't know exactly how expensive it's going to be. And you don't get to decide on the treatment that you get or how affordable that treatment is going to be. They are going to make all the decisions for you and then give you a bill at the end. And if you can't pay that bill, they can't take you to court. The hospitals can take the patient to court. Yeah. Once a month, the Panda County Courthouse sees patients or sees um, cases where the, our local hospitals are taking patients to court for untreated medical. It's a whole day. It's crazy. So can you imagine how frustrating this would be for a patient? Especially if we, as healthcare workers, are making decisions that they are going to have to pay the bill for. Does that make sense? So we have to be aware of this, how this works in healthcare so that we're making good decisions for our patients. And part of that is not using supplies that we don't need to use. 
Okay. I actually went and sat through one of those those days of courthouse. <coughs> there were probably about 60 people that were being taken to court. And they were garnishing paychecks for medical debt. This is serious. So we have to be good towards our patients' money. So basins are going to be no soap zones. We have a washing skill. That means that washing is going to require water. So at some point, we're going to have to go get water in this basin. So let's try to figure out when we should do that. So we did our opening, because that always comes first. Knock, knock, knock. I'm Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I need to do hand and nail care. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, get a barrier. Supplies on the barrier. Now I'm ready for water. Remember that I've already washed my hands and all I've touched are clean items. So can I touch that faucet to turn the water on? No. What do I need between my hands? Yeah, paper towel. So we want to make sure that when we're turning the water on, we're not touching it with our bare hands. We're going to check the water temperature with inside of our wrist. It should feel warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. But your patient is going to interpret that temperature much differently than you do. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Remember how I said that I am up and moving and the way I feel this temperature is different than the way you guys feel it. Remember that? Well, that gets amplified when we're older. And let me explain why. Have you ever seen an old person's arm? I mean, like a really old person's arm. So when we have a really old person, it looks like it's skin over bone with big veins running. I mean, you can actually see the veins. They look like, like ropes underneath the skin. Well, mine doesn't look like that. I'm starting to. <laughs> getting older. Um, yours doesn't look like that. So how do we go from you to that? Well, as we age, the fat underneath our skin, subcutaneous fat, tends to get resorbed especially in our extremity. It breaks down. It goes away. So you end up with skin over muscle with blood vessels right underneath. So what does that mean to us? What, why do we care about that? Well, that subcutaneous fat does a lot of things, a lot of very important things that are going to affect how we do this skill. Oh, we just talked about that. So I've got all these nice little straight graphics and I forget to use them. No soap zones. Oh, we're getting Okay. So, skin changes during aging. So, when you're younger, you've got a layer of muscle, a nice thicker layer of subcutaneous fat, and then your skin. But as you age, all of these layers get thinner. The skin gets thinner. Your patient's going to be likely to have skin tears. The layer of subcutaneous fat goes way down. And then our muscle also shrinks. So, this sets us up for a lot of really bad um, problems. So think of this layer of fat like a wetsuit, okay? <coughs> the wetsuit keeps inside temperatures inside, and it helps keep outside temperatures outside. Does anybody know what normal body temperature is? Okay, so yeah, 98.6 is kind of our benchmark, but anywhere between 97.6 and 99.6 is considered accurate. Let's just go with 98 degrees. Let's make it a nice even number, okay? Now, it is not quite 98 degrees outside. It will be later today, but it's not quite there. But when you guys came in, what were you, what, what did you say about the weather? It's hot. It's hot, not even 98 degrees, and it's hot out there, and yet she runs at 98 degrees right next to so do you. So do you. You guys all run at 98 degrees. So we don't really think about how hot our bodies are, but your body is hotter 
than that outside temperature. That's important. We're going to come back to that in just a second. That's important. 98 degrees is hot. Now, the thing about this is room temperature always wins. If you take a pie out of the oven and it's piping hot, you know, the inside of the pie is around 300 degrees, and you put it on your counter, what happens? Does it stay hot? No. What does it do? It it's going to become room temperature if you leave it there long enough. You take ice cubes out of your freezer, and they're super cold. They're freezing. I mean, ice, right? So it's freezing. You leave them on your counter, what happens? They melt. They melt. They come to room temperature. So room temperature always wins. Got it? Okay. Bodies, human bodies, 98 degrees, give or take, have to stay above 95 to live. 95 is hypothermia. 95 is hypothermia. Below that, you cannot survive. So what did I just say about room temperature? Always when. We have to stay at 98. And that's okay if room temperature is 98. But room temperature is not 98 because we just decided 98 is hot. That's not room temperature. Room temperature is usually around 72. 75 maybe if you're a little cold, right? So let's just use 75 as a nice, e uh, nice, easy number to work with, okay? So if we have 75 degree room temperature and your body has to stay at 98 degrees and room temperature always wins, that's a recipe for disaster. That's a serious problem here. That's why we have subcutaneous fat because every food that you eat gets burned those calories get burned to generate heat. That is the main reason why you eat. You think it's for nutrition. Nutrition plays into it. We need nutrition, yes. But a big part of why you eat is to maintain, burn calories to maintain your 98 degree status. So if you don't have a way of retaining some of that heat, that means your body's furnace is constantly working. That's a lot of energy to expend. So we have this subcutaneous fat to help keep this body heat inside. Make sense? What do you think happens when we don't have a, a wet food on anymore? When we don't have a way of keeping that body heat inside? What happens? Okay. All right, so our body heat is going to dissipate, which means we're going to have to work even harder to keep that temperature up. And chances are we're not going to get to that 98 degree mark. It's probably going to be a little bit less, like in the 97 degree range, which is what we see in a lot of older people because their body just can't generate enough heat to get to that normal value anymore. Make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. But that wet suit does something else as well. It keeps outside temperatures out. So yeah, it's really horribly, miserably hot out there. But the nice thing is that even though it's miserably hot, it's not really getting inside you. Your body, the, your fat is able to kind of block some of that heat out. If you were up north in a blizzard, that super, super cold weather isn't really going to penetrate and get into you because, yeah, because you've got that fat layer to help block some of that. Make sense? You with me? So if we don't have our fat layer, outside temperatures are going to become much more extreme feeling to us. Have you ever seen an older patient that said, oh, I can't handle the cold anymore. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that? Can't handle, this is why most people retired to Florida, 
right? They can't handle the extreme cold from up north anymore because they don't have that layer of protection. Make sense? So when we're working with older patients, they are often going to feel cold because they don't have that layer of fat and cold in their body temperature. So you may be like, oh my gosh, Martha, it's, it's so hot in here, I'm dying. And she's like all bundled up in a little pink sweater and going, oh, it's not hot at all. Have you ever walked into grandma's house? And you're like, grandma, it's 85 in here. Let's turn the air on. She's like, oh, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And that's because their method of keeping their body temperature elevated is not working properly anymore. Make sense? So why do we care about this? Well, if we're talking about temperatures, we have to also think about water temperature because they're not going to have the same protective layers that we have. So when I put my wrist underneath the water and I check it and it feels warm to me, when I take it over to my patient, they may say, oh, that's way too hot for me. You need to understand that they are experiencing temperatures in a totally different way than you are. Don't argue with them. A lot of CNAs will argue with patients. It is not that hot. I just liked it. It's fine. No, it's not. They don't have the same protective layers. Does that make sense? I'll tell you one of the worst. This was horrible. We're sitting in a nursing station in a nursing home, and the shower was like down, halfway down the shower room. And I was hearing screams, I mean, screams coming from the shower room. So I get up, run down to the shower room, I think if somebody fell or something catastrophic happened. And when I open the door to the shower room, steam comes billowing out. And I look inside the shower room and there's like a little half wall there to kind of, you know, um, guard privacy, right? But I can see the patient, like from here up, sitting in a shower chair and just kicking and, and hitting and, and trying to, to get away from the CNA. And the CNA got a silk rag and is trying to clean and dodge. And, and I'm like, what is going on here? And the patient is just screaming. Whoa, whoa, what's going on here? And the patient who, she was a patient, she was completely found mine. The CNA wasn't listening to her. She's like, it's too hot, it's too hot, it's too hot. So I go and turn the water right off. I'm like, what? what's going on? And the patient's like, the water's too hot, and she won't fix it. And the CNA's like, it's not that hot, I checked it. And I said, well, what's comfortable for you is not comfortable for the patient. So we, I turned the water back on, made it a little bit cooler. The patient calmed right down, let me finish the shower. No fuss, no problems. And afterwards, I asked the CNA, why didn't you listen to the patient? Well, she's old. Okay, yeah, she's got some age on her, but what does that have to do with why you didn't listen? Her being old has nothing to do with you not listening. She's, well, all old people are confused. No, all old people are not confused. If she says it's too hot, that means it's too hot. Fix it. Fix it. Don't assume that she is confused and ignore her. That's horrible. Help isn't help if it doesn't help. And in this case, the CNA was not helping anybody in that scenario. Wasn't helping me. I still had to go to the shower room. Wasn't helping the patient. Because the patient felt neglected, harmed. And it wasn't helping her because the patient is now combative, which makes the shower twice as long. She didn't help anybody. So we've got to be careful to remember that we are there to help, not to control, not to take over, not to be difficult. We're just there to help. Now, on that note, we also have to remember that different people have different preferences. Me, I like my showers as hot as humanly 
possible. I want it to remove skin, right? I want it hot. If there isn't steam billowing, it's not hot enough for me. I like hot, hot, hot showers. My husband, on the other hand, cannot stand hot showers. He thinks I'm insane. He likes cool showers. I mean, almost cold. I think he's kind of nutty, but you know. We all have different preferences. Don't assume that the way you like to bathe is the way the patient likes to bathe. Don't assume the way you like to eat is the way the patient likes to eat. We're going to get into that a little later. We have to remember that our experience is not, it's individual to us. It is not anybody else's. Good. So when we get water, we're going to check it with the inside of our wrist. It should feel warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. But who else do you think needs to check that water? That is a graded checkpoint. And it is an important graded checkpoint for every washing skill we do. Because help isn't help if it doesn't help. Good? Make sense? Okay. So remember that this layer of fat is kind of like a wetsuit that you never take off, but it does over time tend to diminish. And that layer of fat is going to help when your body generates heat, it's going to help retain that heat. And it also helps block out outside temperatures. So remember that layer of fat acts as an insulator and we lose it as we age. So we always ask the patient to check the water. Now, if you look at the bottom of page, um, uh, uh, page 82, how long do we have to do this skill? 11 minutes. 11 minutes is a long time, guys. It is a long time. You got way more time than you need to do this. But if you're taking all 11 minutes, remember room temperature always wins, right? Warm water. <coughs> is going to get cool very quickly. Room temperature is cool water, guys, not warm. So if we're taking the whole 11 minutes here, that water might cool down and become uncomfortable for the patient. What do you think we should do if the water cools down? Change the water, warm it back up. Yep, change the water. Don't ignore this. Don't tell the patient, oh, we're almost done, everything's fine. Help isn't help if it doesn't help, right? Good. So we're going to have the patient check the water every single skill. And if the water starts to get cold or it gets soapy, we're going to change that water out. Good. All right. So whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Now, the reason for that is because, yeah, whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. So you do this in the shower without thinking about it. You would never get out of the shower with shampoo in your hair and soap on your skin. You just wouldn't do it. It, 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 it would feel weird. Right? You're not done. So you won't do this to yourself, but for some reason you'll do it to patients, <laughs> and I don't know why. When you guys are practicing, rinsing is the one step that almost everybody forgets. And it's because you're doing it on somebody else. And I know that you guys are like, no, not me. I'm not going to forget to rinse. That's kind of silly. I'll, of course I'll rinse. Yeah, somebody in here, when you're practicing, will forget to rinse. It's just law of averages. So when you're doing washing skills, I actually, in your brain, you don't have to say it out loud, but in your brain, I want, as you're doing the steps, I want you to think, whatever I wash, I, whatever I rinse, I, yeah, every time. If you do that, you'll never forget one of these steps. It is, it, but the problem with it is sitting over there, it's very logical. 
right? Whatever I wash, I rinse, whatever. Yeah, I know that. I don't need to say it. I, I know I'm going to do it. You won't though. You will forget to rinse or you're going to forget to dry. Partial bed bath. When we get to that skill and you're washing the face, about half of the people forget to dry the face. It, it just, it, it happens because I think your brain just goes into overload with all the steps that that's got a lot of steps, all the steps you have to do. And about half the people forget to dry the face for partial bed bath. So if you get in the habit now on a simple skill, hand and nail care, if you get in the habit now of whatever I wash, I, whatever I rinse, I every single time, make it a habit, then you don't skip a step. Okay. I know it, it kind of sounds simple, simplistic, but trust me, when I give you these tips, it's for a reason. Okay. Good. So why would that be important? Why is rinsing important? Can you imagine leaving soap on the skin for days? Oh, yeah, it's going to dry out the skin horribly. It's going to be itchy. It could even cause rashes. Um, so here's another story. Ironically enough, same CNA. <laughs> Ironically enough, same CNA. So... Um, Similar time frame, maybe a couple of weeks before or after, I can't remember, but we had a couple of bed-bound patients. And the bed-bound patients that we had, um, they were all advanced dementia stages. They were truly bed-bound. They couldn't communicate. And there were three of them, and they all developed a rash, like on their torso, on their back, on their stomach, on their arms. And, and we're trying to figure out, oh, my gosh, do we have – a communicable disease going around. Why do these patients have, but it didn't seem to affect the other patients. Why are these patients all of a sudden developing rush? So now we're doing temperature checks. We're checking for bed bugs. We're doing all kinds of stuff to try to figure out why these patients had a rash. Well, it turns out, same CNA, when she was giving a bed bath, she was not rinsing. And over a couple of weeks, of having soap, 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 soap with no rinsing. It dried out the skin so much that they developed a rash. I mean, we were going to laundry. Did you change the soaps? I mean, what in the world is going on with these people? And it turns out it was just not being rinsed. Yeah. We, well, we don't even know that. We don't even know if she dried. We have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Another CNA told on her. Yeah, I mean that. That's how we found out. Yeah, she's the uh, another CNA said. You know, I don't. I don't think that she's rinsing the patients. So we brought her in and sat her down and said, "Can you walk us through a partial bed bath? You know, how how are you doing this?" And there was a, a education coordinator that had to check everybody off every year on your skills. And um, so we kind of did it as part of her skills check. You know, can you walk us through it? And, you know, she wasn't rinsing. So we remediated her, you know, explained how important that is and showed her the effects, you know, and, and how uncomfortable that must be for the patients because rash, they're going to be itchy, but they've got dementia and they can't scratch. And if they could scratch, oh my gosh, that's a whole nother problem, right? So this is uncomfortable. So we kind of walked her through that. Um, remediation goes a long way. Sometimes you do things and you don't really understand the effects of what you're doing. And once you're aware of them, you can change, right? So it's not all about punishing people. We we're, we're really don't want to punish anybody. We want everybody to elevate their skill level. So remediation goes a long way. Um, this poor CNA, she did not have a good instructor, so she needed a lot of remediation, but she went on to, to have a very successful career as a CNA, so good. All right, so here are our specific steps for this skill. So for hand and nail care, these are our specific steps. Now, you don't have this in your book, <coughs> new book will. But you do have it on these sheets. Remember these guys? Right? Remember these? 
you do have um, this on here. Okay, so in order to do this skill properly, we're gonna soak the hand in water. Then we're going to wash the hand, rinse the hand and dry the hand. Now, when we do that, okay, remember we're only doing one hand, right? We put the hand in the basin and remember we can't put soap in the basin, can we? So we're gonna take the hand out of the basin, put soap on the washcloth. So we're gonna wet the washcloth, wring it out really well, no dripping wet washcloths anywhere. So wring that washcloth out really well, put soap on the washcloth, wash the hand out here. Once we get the hand washed, we can put it back in the basin to rinse it, okay? Then we have to dry it. So we're gonna take it out of the basin dry. So it's kind of like the hokey pokey. Put the right hand in, put the right hand out, <laughs> right hand in and shake it all about, right? So it's like the hokey pokey. So once you take the hand out from rinsing, you're gonna put it on a towel to dry it. Then you're gonna take an orange stick and go underneath each nail to clean it. But we don't want junk from under this nail to go under this one. No importing of junk. So we're gonna take the orange stick and clean under the nail and wipe it off on the towel before we go to the next nail. We'll clean under that one, wipe that off on the towel, go to the next nail. Clean that one, wipe that one off on the towel, go to the next nail. So when you are using orange sticks, this is an orange stick, some of you call them cuticle sticks. Um, we're gonna use the slanted end to clean under the nails, kind of like a scoop, not the pointed end, good? When we file, um, so here you can see that we're uh, cleaning and then wiping on the, uh, the towel. When we're filing the nails with an emery board, we wanna go in one direction only, one direction only. So this is a change for most of you. This is not how we do our own nails. This is an emery board. If I have a nail that needs to be filed, I would take the emery board and I would go across my nail rapidly back and forth, just like this, to file the nail. That's how we usually file our own nails at home, right? The problem is that as we age, nails become brittle. When we go back and forth rapidly, with this, what we're doing is pushing and pulling the nail as the emery board goes across it. That puts a lot of pressure right on the center of the nail and the nail will split. And when it splits, it can split all the way down. And that's very, very painful. So when we're filing nails, we don't go rapidly back and forth. We go in one direction only toward the center. So instead of going back and forth, I would take the emery board just like this, one direction toward the center. On this side, one direction toward the center. And then at the top, straight across. Okay, good? Questions? Okay. So use emery board to file in one direction toward the center. When you're doing all this, just make sure you support that arm and wrist usually on the table, on the towel is fine. We're gonna apply lotion last, but anytime we put lotion on, we're going to squeeze lotion in your hand, warm it up in your hands, then apply it. Once you've applied it, you're gonna take a towel and wipe off the excess, because your skin can only absorb so much. If we leave lotion on the surface of the skin and they go to pick up a cup of hot coffee, what happens? Yeah. So anytime we put lotion on, we warm it up first and then wipe off the excess. And lotion is always applied last. Good? Questions? Used to be, we used to just throw the lotion bottle inside the water, the, the basin of water. Remember that basin is just warm, not hot, not cold, just warm, right? And that warm water over time might possibly, maybe, warm up the outside edges of the lotion, but it's not gonna do anything to penetrate to the middle. And that's where we're getting our lotion from is the middle. So that's not an effective way of warming up your lotion. Much better to put it in your hands and rub it. What body temperature are we? 90. Yeah, ni yeah, at least 98 degrees, right? So when we're doing this, we're warming it up to at least 98 degrees or body temperature. 
and that way it doesn't shock our patient. Good? The water in the basin is not going to do that. So don't use the water in the basin to warm your patients. Um, oops. Okay. So let me show you this video. And I think we have our sound problem fixed, but I'm not sure. We're going to try this out. Just a second. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Wonderful. I need to do hand and nail care on one hand. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands and then I'll gather my supplies. Okay. Okay, we're going to start with a barrier. So I'll place a barrier on the table and that will give me a place to set your clean supplies. And then I'm going to gather a basin, soap, and lotion.
Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Wonderful. I need to do hand and nail care on one hand. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands and then I'll gather my supplies. Okay. Okay, we're going to start with the barrier, so I'll place the barrier on the table and that will give me a place to set your clean supplies. And then I'm going to gather a basin, soap, and lotion. An orange stick and emery board. Two washcloths and a towel. I'm going to go get some water in the basin. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature, make yes, sure it's okay? It is, is it good? Yes. Okay, you can submerge your hand in there if you'd like. Okay. And I'll bring that tray a little bit closer to you. Thank you. Is that comfortable? Yes. I'm going to place the washcloths in here, and we'll wet one of the washcloths and use it to get your hand wet. Now I'm going to place your hand over here on the towel. Apply soap to the washcloth. And now I'm going to wash all surfaces of your hand, including in between the fingers, in this area between the thumb and the forefinger. We're going to turn your hand over now and wash the palm of your hand. Now we're going to place your hand back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to bring your hand over here to dry. I'm going to dry between the fingers. And then I'm going to turn your hand over and dry the palm of the hand as well. Okay. Now we'll take the orange stick and I'm going to clean under each nail. Just cleaning the edge. Does that hurt? No. Very good. We'll wipe the orange stick on the towel in between each finger. And now I'm going to file any rough edges. So I'll file from the outer edge to the middle. Checking each nail for any rough edges. And now we can apply lotion. So I'll get a little lotion, warm it up in my hands, and apply it to all surfaces of your hand. Does that feel good? Yes. Very good. Okay. Now we'll wipe off the lotion. Okay. How's that? Great. Wonderful. I'm going to place my soiled linens in a dirty linen container and then clean up my workspace. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, on the way, we'll pick up the soap and the lotion and place them in the basin. We'll use the paper towel to open the drawer and place the basin in. These items will get thrown away.
Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I offer you a magazine? No, ma'am. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right there. Please use it to call me if you have a need. I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done.
Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to change your sheets. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. We'll start out with a barrier. I'm going to get a top sheet, a bottom sheet, and a pillowcase, and a privacy blanket. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this blanket over you. This will help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this scale, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm going to spread it out. Can you hold that blanket in place? Yes. And I'm going to remove the sheet from the bed. We'll place the sheet in dirty linen. Mr. Jones, can I get you to scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll up so that you're on your side facing in that direction? Thank you. I'll remove the two corners of the sheet from this side of the bed. And I'm going to roll the soiled sheet in toward the patient, tightly. I'm going to tuck it up underneath the patient all along the length of his body. Now I'll take the clean sheet, unfold it, spread it out on the mattress, and attach the corners. Now I'll roll the clean sheet toward me. We'll roll it so that it's tight with no wrinkles as we tuck it under the soil sheet. Okay, Mr. Jones, come on back onto your back, and I need you to scoot to the center of the bed, please. Thank you. Can you scoot toward me, please? And can you roll so that you're laying on your side facing away from me? Thank you. I'll now remove the sheet from the bed that was soiled, wrapping it into a ball. and I'll go place this in dirty linen. Now I'll unroll the clean sheet and secure the corners on the mattress. As I do so, I'll make sure to stretch the sheet so that it's flat and minimize the wrinkles that are underneath the patient. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you come back onto your back, please? And scoot to the middle. Thank you. I'm now going to place the top sheet over you. And I'll remove that bath blanket now. Roll it in a ball and place it in dirty linen. Now I'm going to secure the sheet. I'm going to lift the mattress and smooth the sheet down so that it's flat under the mattress on both sides.
Okay, I'll make hospital corners by lifting the top edge of the sheet about a foot from the end of the mattress straight up. It'll form a triangle. Everything else will get tucked underneath. I'll repeat that on this side. And I'll loosen this over his toes so he has some wiggle room. There, how's that, Mr. Jones? Perfect, thank you. Very good. I'm going to remove the pillow from under your head. I'll bring it right back. I'll remove the pillowcase, being careful not to allow it to touch my uniform, and lay the pillow on the overbed table. We'll place the pillowcase in dirty linen. I'll take the clean pillowcase and scrunch it up all the way to the edges. We'll put the tag side in, place the pillowcase on top of the tag side of the pillow, and pull the sides down. I'll now place the pillow under his head with the opening facing away from the door. How is that, Mr. Jones? Perfect, thank you. Are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please don't hesitate to call. Can I get you something like a magazine? No, thank you. Okay, I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. The barrier will be thrown away. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. 